really to, to show how understanding that basic biology of the queens helps to translate into some more pragmatic application for us, the beekeeping community, and how we're able to harness that information now so that we can utilize it to improve our craft, okay? So um, the story kind of picks up from where we left off this morning where we were talking about kind of what um, makes a good, well-mated queen. And so that then prompted me to start asking, well, what are we buying as beekeepers uh, when we buy queens from commercial queen producers? How well-mated are they? Um, and what's really, what makes this very uh, relevant and important, um, and just, just to show that this issue is, is something that's, that's very important, um, the Bee Informed Partnership, something that was mentioned earlier today, um, has been doing surveys for, for quite a number of years, and what we've suggested is, is asking every year beekeepers and why their colonies die, and asking them why they think, attributing a reason to why their colonies die. And so, just as this uh, survey is an example, um, dwindling colonies in the fall, that is, those colonies that have symptoms that are consistent with colony collapse disorder, for better or worse of, of a term, is about 10% of the colonies. That ranked number four on, on the list. Um, varroa mites was the attributed factor in about a quarter of the colonies. That was third on the list. Nutrition and starvation problems was ranked number two on the list. But the number one problem, 31% of the beekeepers in this particular survey suggested that poor queens was their number one concern and their number one problem and reason why their bees are dying. They're being superseded early or they were not successfully requeened. Difficulty in introducing queens, premature failure in egg laying. Okay, they become drone layers very quickly within just a couple months in some cases. We already surveyed the audience earlier this morning showing that there's a pretty good prevalence of that just among our own experiences, right? So what do all of those symptoms, given what we've learned earlier this morning, what do they all have in common? What does it all indicate that something that's wrong with the queens? They may not be mating with enough drones. Okay, so what started as just trying to understand the basic biology of queens can now be asked in a very different light and saying, ah, could that be the reason why beekeepers, the majority of beekeepers are experiencing these problems with queens, okay? Now, how then, other than this mating issue that we talked about this morning, what are some other ways that one can assess and kind of measure a queen to see how good she is, all right? And there's three general categories that one can measure a queen and make some sort of determination about whether she's good or bad. The first is just the physical quality of the queen. So this is indicative of her body size and other kind of morphometric analyses, okay? but also the parasitism of queens. So queens can come up with certain diseases, not all of them that uh, colonies are afflicted with, but they certainly are, are um, you know, rife with different parasites that can diminish their quality, all right? The second area of what makes a good queen a good queen is her insemination quality. That is the number and quality of the sperm that's stored in her spermatheca. Right? So it's not just the sperm count, but how many of those sperm are actually alive. If you think about it, a queen, if she is supposed to live two or three years, but she only mates when she's a week old, she has to keep those five to seven million sperm in the spermatheca alive for up to three years. 
that's a pretty hostile environment, right? They, they, the sperm need to get oxygen and nutrition and other things. That's pretty tough to do. So, you know, sperm can die inside the queen spermatheca. So keeping them alive is, uh, is really important. Therefore, measuring the viability of the sperm is important. And then finally, as we discussed this morning, it's not just the number of sperm, but it's the number of drones that contribute to that sperm that results in colony diversity. All right? So all of these factors are interrelated with each other, but there are separate ways of empirically measuring how good a queen is. Okay, now it's not how pretty she looks, right? Or, you know, how, um, you know, how she behaves or anything. Those really don't have anything to do with how good a queen is, but these are kind of empirical predictors of queen quality. So I should mention that what we did in these studies um, is that we went to the back of the beekeeping periodicals, just like any of you would, when you need to buy a queen. And we went and we chose an assortment of different queen breeders from the southeast and from the west, where the two kind of hotbeds of where the commercial queen producer industry uh, are located. And we got big and small, um, you know, kind of old and new uh, operations. And we, we ordered a dozen queens from each of these different operations. And in doing so, we wanted to make sure that um, they didn't see, oh, this is, you know, NC State University for an experiment, so we're going to cherry pick our best queens and send those to them, right? We got an undergrad who was working in our program named Joe Flowers, and he was actually living out at our B lab. Um, and so it was just a normal street address ordered by literally Joe the beekeeper, right? Um, and sent to us. So this was very kind of cryptic. Nobody knew this was blind. And so nobody was cherry picking um, their, their queens and sending them to us. So, so we think this is a fairly representative cross section and sampling of everything that, that we're buying as an industry. Okay? So what we did is we uh, measured these queens in these various different ways. The physical quality, the insemination quality, and the mating quality. All right. So we did things like measured their morphometrics, and these are fairly standard means of measuring body size, okay? Weight, thorax width, that's kind of the wing injunction to the wing injunction, the head width, the wing lengths, all these different body parts, right? And as you might imagine, what this graph shows you, although I, I don't expect you to read it, is that all of these things are correlated, all right? Um, so, heavier queens tended to be wider, all right? Not exactly rocket surgery, right? Is this on? Okay. All right. so, um, so, all of these things are correlated, but this is good, right? Because it shows that bigger queens are indeed bigger, and we can measure them in different independent ways and show that in different aspects. Now, they're not all perfect proxies of one another, but these are all different angles, different facets of the same, of the same thing that we're looking at, okay? Yeah? How do you weigh a queen? How do you weigh a queen? With a scale. No, we have, uh, we have very sensitive scales that go down to 0.1 milligrams. Um, and to get them so that they're not moving, you actually put them in the freezer at minus 20 for about for four or five minutes. They stop moving, so you can weigh them very quickly, but then they kind of warm up and, um, and walk around and it doesn't harm them at all. Um, so these are all non-destructive and these are things that you can do yourself um, if you really wish. So, you know, again, so this is one way of looking at, you know, queens. And again, bigger queens are presumably better. So another kind of anatomical measure that we've done is looking at their ovaries. Now this is, uh, unlike measuring body size, which is non-destructive, measuring their ovaries, unfortunately, is permanent, right? Um, but we're scientists, so we're allowed to do this. Um, but 
if you've ever dissected open a, uh, a queen's over, uh, abdomen, uh, pretty much their entire abdomen is just filled with these two ovaries, right? These are just the egg producing factories of the queen. She has to lay 1,800 eggs, up to 1,800 eggs a day, um, which means that they are very, very, um, a lot of turnover. And um, each one of these ovaries is like kind of a bundled sheath of these individual strands. I don't know if you can see them in this lighting, but each one of these individual strands is called an ovariole, right? So there's about 150 to 180 ovarioles per ovary for a good queen, right? So a good queen has about 300 plus ovarioles between her two ovaries. And each one of those, you start with these very small egg follicles at the very top, and then they're nourished um, and grow and grow and grow as they descend down until they get to the very bottom and they're fully formed eggs that are ready to be laid. So the idea here is that the fecundity, or the number of eggs that a queen can lay per unit time, is presumably a function of the number of ovarioles that they have, right? So we uh, were able to dissect out a lot of these different ovaries and then um, take cross sections of them and then count the number of ovarioles. Very tedious, but very, um, you know, robust data to be able to see if the egg laying capacity of queens is markedly different. Now, as I said, another aspect of the physical health of queens, not just their body size or their fecundity, but also the degree to which they're parasitized. Now, queens do not get parasitized by varroa mites, correct? Why not? Anybody know? Way too short a development time. They develop in 16 days. Varroa can't turn around their development in that time. So um, queens are, you know, uh, fortunately not subject to varroa parasitism, but they can be parasitized by other things. What's this on the left? Nosema. Nosema. It's that gut parasite, right? Um, and previous studies have really shown that, that queens can be really laden down with, with nosema and cause really significant problems. This is um, something that's not nearly as problematic as it used to be. Um, for you new beekeepers, it's probably something you haven't even learned in bee school, right? This is uh, the tracheal mite. Historically, again, that was a real problem for queens. Um, it infects their breathing tubes in the, in the trachea. And then uh, any number of different viruses can um, infect queens. And viruses are, are one of these um, really nefarious, invisible factors when it comes to queen and colony health. Because if a queen is infected with most of these different viruses, when she lays an egg, the virus is transmitted through the egg to her offspring. So if a queen is infected, then her colony is infected. So we don't really know the effects of the viruses on the queen herself, but we know that it can uh, promote an environment of having a colony that has a lot of virus in it, okay? So these are other things that we looked at um, in this survey. As I said, the insemination um, health of queens is really important. Queens are supposed to have five to seven million sperm. So in this survey, looking at, okay, well, how well inseminated are these commercially produced queens? And not only that, we uh, were looking at not just the sperm count, but the sperm viability. So this is where um, some of the um, cellular staining technologies that are available today are really, really cool. You can't really see it on this slide at all, but what um, happens is that you can um, dissect out the spermatheca, you can disperse the sperm, you can cr uh, crush open the spermatheca and disperse the sperm into a, a fluid um, where the, the sperm are still alive. And then you subject the sperm to two different dyes, all right? And if the sperm are alive, they will acquire one of those dyes, and then under a fluorescent microscope, they will glow green, all right? 
So on the left hand side you see a lot of dots that are glowing green which means those sperm are alive. But if the sperm are dead, they'll pick up the other dye and they'll fluoresce red. And so that's what's over here that you can't see at all, um, but those are supposed to be a bunch of red dots. And so pretty much what you do is you count up the green dots and the red dots and you take this, the percent of the green dots of the total and you can get a percentage of the sperm that are viable. Okay? So a queen could have 5 million sperm, but if 25% of them are viable, that's not really much good. Right? So again, different measures, different ways to look at how good queens are. And then finally, we measured the mating frequency of the queens where we allowed the, uh, the queens to lay for a little bit and we sampled the worker offspring. And again, using kind of molecular genetic tools, we can quantify the different subfamilies from the different drone fathers and find out kind of who the daddies are of the different workers and then count up the number of drones and that's the mating number of the queens. All right. So we put all of this together and we measured all of these queens in all, all of these different ways. Again, with the hypothesis that the reason why queens were failing is because something is different now that didn't used to be 10, 15, 20 years ago that we can point to and say, ah, the queens aren't mating enough, we need to do X, Y, and Z, and then all of these queen problems will go away, right? And what's really nice about studying honeybees, we're able to go back into the literature and look and see, okay, well this is what queens used to look like when queens would live two to three years, we we'll look at what queens look like today, and if there's anything that's really obviously different between those two things, that's going to be the red flag, that's going to be the thing that's going to say, ah, that's the reason why. So we went back, all the way back to 1947, is where we're able to get kind of a baseline of what queens are supposed to look like. All right? And then subsequent studies all you know, through the decades looking at queens for their parasitism rate, their you know, fecundity, uh, their sperm counts, all of these different things. Okay? Now without going through this entire matrix and bore you even further, let me just cut to the chase and say that contrary to what we assumed or we predicted, there wasn't anything that really stood out. There wasn't something glaring that the queen's ovaries were all of a sudden dried up and small. There wasn't anything where their parasitism was a lot higher. In fact, it was markedly absent. Um, it wasn't that their sperm counts were substantially lower. In fact, they were pretty much the same as historical levels as far as sperm counts go, about an average of about four million. Um, and then again, mating number, the average mating number that we learned this morning among queens is about 12. Well, we found that commercially produced queens mate on average 12.1 time. So right in line with expectation. So while everybody is out there going around and blaming that commercial queens aren't mating enough and they're you know, not as good anymore and blah, 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 when you actually go and do the testing, the data don't suggest that it's that easy, that it's that simple. Which means that they're being superseded prematurely and they're failing earlier for some other reason. Okay? So this is very uh, eye-opening and enlightening um, but it actually hasn't gotten us to a concrete answer, at least not yet. Okay? Now, given that finding, that then enabled us to, to ask some other very interesting questions. Well, just how bad can queens get? Again, we're scientists. We're allowed to do this stuff. You're not as beekeepers, right? But we can and have, for several studies now, purposefully made really bad queens. All right? Now how do we do that? Well, for any of you that have taken a queen rearing course, you'll almost certainly have been told by your instructors that 
the lar the worker larvae that you take out of the worker cells and you transfer into the queen cups, you want them to be as small, that is as young as possible. In fact, the ideal size of the larvae that you transfer are the ones you can't see. That's how small they are, right? So the smallest possible larvae are the ones that you want to graft in order to make queens. Now why is that? Well, that's what this graphic is um, uh, trying to attempt. So, you know, any egg that is laid spends three days in the egg stage. And then once it's hatched as a larva, right, you want to raise that queen from the youngest possible larva. That is, the larva itself will be fed royal jelly for its entire larval environment, and entire larval development, okay? And it will make the highest quality queen, right? So this is, the y-axis here is kind of the queen quality, where really good queen up here, really bad queen down here, right? So the earlier, the younger that larva is, the longer it's fed royal jelly, it's going to make a better, superior queen. However, if you want, I don't suggest this, but one can graft one, two, or even three day old larvae. All right? So you can take these larger worker larvae that have spent one or two or three days as developing as a worker and then transfer that into a queen cup, right? The workers will then still provision that as a larva or as a queen, feed it royal jelly, and it will develop into a queen. But it's not going to make as good of a queen, all right? It's going to make a lower quality queen because it's already spent a couple days developing as a worker, not as a queen. So that resultant queen is more worker-like. It's smaller, it has smaller ovaries, it mates fewer times, everything else. And in fact, there's a cutoff point at three and a half days as a larva, you can't make a queen anymore from a worker larva that you graft at three and a half days. After that, it becomes this inner cast and it becomes a worker. It's not gonna be able to mate and it's not gonna be able to become a queen, all right? So, we think of queens and workers as these two distinct entities within our colonies. But developmentally, genetically, it's really one big continuum. F females that are of high reproductive quality and females that are of low reproductive quality are sterile. The, the workers and queens are the polar ends of it, but we can make things in between because we're scientists, right? So we make these low quality queens on purpose, as bad as we can make them, all right? Now, why, why on earth would we do that? Oh, so this is again to show this, right? So here's a, a graftable frame, and you take these really, really small larvae, those result in high quality queens. These older worker larvae, they're about maybe this size here, um, those grafted into queen cells, those make low quality queens. And so we can do this very readily and make kind of these polar ends of the spectrum from as good a queen as we can make to as bad a queen as we can make. And so what we do, what we did um, in some of these experiments is that we then measured these queens in the same way. Their physical size, their insemination quality, and their mating quality. And we found, again, that all of these things are very much interrelated. That bigger queens, um, high quality queens tend to be bigger, uh, they tend to have higher sperm counts, and they tend to mate with more drones. So all of these things are all very consistent with each other. And we're able then to put all of them together to be able to make quantifiable judgments about how good a queen is. Now I know that um, there are three types of, um, of liars in the world. You have liars, damn liars, and statisticians, right? <laughs> but the use of statistics, while many times mysterious, you're just going to have to trust me that we can take all of these different measurements and collapse them down 
into a single variable that we can just call queen quality, right? And then, oh dear. Okay, so this right here is a graphic that if it actually appeared would utterly convince you of what I'm saying. Okay. <laughs> Um, in essence, we're able to, using these complicated statistics, we're able to collapse all of these different measurements down into one that we'll call queen quality, and it's like a ruler. It's like a standard ruler. So we have the best queens we can make to the worst queens we can make, and we can measure that with a repeated way um, that doesn't change. We have the full biological spectrum of good to bad. And then any other queen that we get, we can measure it in exactly the same way and place them on this measuring stick to say how good they are. So in general, what of all of these queens that we surveyed of commercially produced queens, we give them a final grade of a B plus, right? So they're not quite the best that nature is able to make, but they're certainly not as bad as nature can make. So there's, it's a very good grade, there's still room for improvement, is the take home message here, all right? So all of this, oh, and just to show that all of these is just measuring the queens, right? But really what matters to us as beekeepers is how does that translate to the colony, right? So we did another experiment where we looked, we made these high low quality queens, and you know, then we placed those high and low quality queens into colonies, and we measured them over time. And what we found was that high quality queens tended to have more comb built, more brood, both worker and drones, and they stored more food, and they, in general, they just grew better and stronger. So what's really cool about this is that this really does have pragmatic applications to us that your queen quality does in fact translate to your colonies and how good your colonies do, all right? And so by measuring the quality of queens and improving the quality of queens, we're able to then improve the, uh, the quality of our colonies. So that then finally leads us to a new initiative that we've launched which is to harness all of these different techniques and all of the things that we've learned and all of the queens that we've measured using these same techniques and using that standard measuring stick and then offering the same service to anybody who wants to measure their queens. And we will then measure them in the same way and give you a report back saying how good these queens are. All right. So this is uh, really born out of the Be Informed Partnership, which we've been involved in um, since the beginning. And we've added this new uh, service to anybody, not just those participating in the Be Informed Partnership, but to anybody who wants to use it. So the, the clinic itself started by quantifying viruses in the population. So this is our small component to the BIP where we've been using uh, quantitative PCR to quantify the different viruses that are out there. So the tech transfer teams as part of the Be Informed Partnership are out there sampling the colonies of participating beekeepers. Some of them they send us workers. We then grind them up and we ascertain the levels of different viruses. And we send these reports back to the beekeepers showing what the overall profile of the uh, viral profiles of colonies in the US versus the viral profiles of their colonies and how they match up. And then we can tell them, well, your colonies have significantly more viruses than on average. Um, we're still not at the point where we can say whether these are good or bad levels because we still don't know how virus levels really translate into colony health. But that's going to be, again, something that's going to be born out of the Be Informed Partnership. But while we're doing this, we're also now measuring queens. And so uh, the folks that do this are two technicians in the lab, Margie Gerganis and uh, the new guy, Dennis Chen, who um, started uh, earlier this year in, in January. And what happens is that any beekeeper 
who's interested in measuring their queens will send us in queens alive, because they have to be uh, processed live, in a standard battery box, just like you receive them in the mail, right? And send them to us um, in the mail, just like this. And then we go through that same standard analytical procedure where we measure their body size and their sperm counts. And this is really facilitated. When we did those scientific studies, it took us about a month or so to quantify the sperm counts of a single queen because we had to dissect and stain and take pictures and then I had undergrads going blind with clickers in front of a computer screen you know, in order to get the sperm counts of the queens. Um, Project Apis M was very generous in um, uh, getting, giving us a grant and buying us this um, cell particle counter that's a uh, fluorescent microscope that has automatic software that counts the sperm automatically. So rather than taking a month, it takes three minutes. So it's a much higher throughput of this, okay? And it's, um, and it's much more accurate too because of that. And so by going through this process, we can uh, take the queens and we can uh, dissect them, analyze them, stain the sperm, and then get these reports back that break down all of these different measurements, the morphological measures, the different diseases, and the insemination success of the queens. And because we have this standard yardstick of what we know to be good and what we know to be bad, we can then rank them statistically and to say that these are you know, very good queens uh, developmentally, but they mated very poorly or vice versa, right? So we can make very objective and accurate uh, predictions and recommendations based on what we find. Now the downside, I know what you're all thinking, the downside is that we can measure these queens and they're like an A plus. And you say, wow, these queens are great, too bad they're dead, <laughs> right? Can't overcome that with the technology that we have. But what we hope is that this is a service that uh, especially larger scale commercial queen producers will use frequently enough to test different cohorts of queens. They produce 2,000 queens at a time. If they can send us 20, assuming that those 20 are representative of the remaining of the, of the 2,000, then they can be assured of what they're producing is indeed going to be adequate. There have been plenty of times when beekeepers are kind of starting very early and the weather isn't that great. They send us queens. Sure enough, the queens didn't mate well enough and they just scrap that whole bit, that, that whole cohort, okay? So it's a way for them to independently verify whether the product that they're making is good. A second group of beekeepers that can really utilize this are the customers you, right? Where if you are having queen problems in your operations and you're going to go through and you're going to pinch the heads on all these queens and buy new ones, rather than pinching their heads, send them into us and we can tell, well, it was the queen's fault or it wasn't. Because a lot of times we're blaming the queens for problems in the colony that it's not the queen's fault. Right? That's what the previous evidence was really showing, that we were all convinced as an industry that the queens weren't mating well enough. But when you actually go and measure, they're mating just fine. So they're not always, it's not always the queen's fault. Right? So this uh, initiative and this tech these techniques will be able to distinguish those things so that oftentimes you don't have to requeen if it's not a queen's problem. So here are just some examples. Oh, goodness. I'm sorry for the uh, graphics not showing up. Um, there was a compatibility issue there. So, okay, so here's just some examples of people that have used the Queen Clinic. Um, this was a, uh, a beekeeper in California that was requeening their operation, as they annually do, and they were requeening with their own queens that they raised. And they were the, introducing the queens, not a problem. 95 plus percent ex, ex, uh, acceptance of the queens, no problem. 
but they ran out of queens. They just couldn't produce enough of their own queens. So they went to another beekeeper and bought a bunch of queens from them. And then they were introducing them in exactly the same way into their operation, but half of those queens were getting rejected. Okay? So this beekeeper was pretty miffed, thinking that they bought a bunch of really bad queens, and you know, that they were kind of blaming that other beekeeper for selling them a bunch of, you know, of really bad queens. So they sent us queens from both, their own queens and the ones that they bought that they thought were inferior. And we measured them using these standard techniques. And surprise, surprise, we found there was no difference in between those two queens. The quality of those queens that were being rejected was not substantially lower than the ones that were being accepted. So this prevented a war between the Hatfields and the McCoys, for one, right? Uh, but it also then led the two beekeepers to start working together and say, okay, well, what really was it about these queens that caused them to be rejected? Because it wasn't their lack of mating or other problems, okay? There's another example. This is a, a commercial queen breeder that uses instrumental insemination. And they wanted to see if the diversity of the drones that are being inseminated was sufficient, right? We learned that queens are supposed to have 12 different drones or on average. Well, because he was doing II, um, he wanted to verify that they were getting enough, not just enough sperm, but enough uh, um, diversity among the drones. So he sent us a bunch of queens, had them tested. What we found was that they were very, very good queens, and they were in fact very highly diverse, on average 20, um, inseminated with at least 20 drones, but the sperm counts were really low. And that was a really red, big red flag uh, to that operation. They were only getting about one to two million sperm on average. And that was because the queens, after they were inseminated, were put into banks rather than mating nukes. And research has shown that queens kind of really need to run around in order to fully acquire a full complement of sperm in their spermatheca. So this completely changed their outlook of how they were going to do their operation. Rather than banking queens after insemination, they were going to keep them in mating nukes. Right. So again, helping to improve these different operations. Jim? Mating nukes with, sorry, so you're right, not putting them into mating nukes, not putting them into banks. So before they were putting them into banks so they couldn't run around, they're just in their cages. But if queens are given access to the combs and they're running around the combs, that helps acquire the sperm. But because these are instrumentally inseminated, you put queen excluders on the front so they can't go and fly again, right? So. So a queen can be instrumentally inseminated with like eight to 10 microliters of semen, but most of that is ejected out the back end, right? Only about five to 10% of the sperm actually make it back into the spermatheca. And that's done through two processes. One is through active swimming. The other is because she's shaking her thing as she's running around. So there's kind of a mechanical pumping that goes on. So when queens are in banks, in cages, they don't have that extra means by which the sperm gets into the spermatheca, okay? So this really helped them understand this. They would have never known this um, without going through this clinic. So this is a way, again, to, for them to refine their process. Oh dear. Um, so if, here's a third case study that is clearly convincing, as you can see. Um, this was a, a beekeeper who uh, was suspecting that there were some real virus problems in their operation. And so they had a bunch of good queens and a bunch of failing queens, and they sent them to us. We tested them for um, sperm viability and for viral levels. 
And here we were able to actually um, underscore their gut feeling that viruses were really causing their, prob their queens to go downhill. We were able to make that association that the poor queens did indeed have low sperm counts and were just swimming with virus, whereas the healthy ones, the good queens, were healthy and relatively virus free. Okay? So there's some sort of connection here and we're able to uh, verify that, but again, we couldn't tell the beekeeper if that was a cause or effect. If the viral infections caused the queens to be bad or if the queens were bad, which opened up the door for the viruses to then uh, infect them. Make sense? So there's still a lot of work to do as far as association versus cause versus effect, but these types of information, this type of data is really, really valuable for, uh, for beekeepers who need it. Mm -hmm. Exactly. So how did this particular queen producer use this information? Yeah, they stopped using those particular lines, um, even though for other reasons those were favored lines that they were using, but um, they wanted to stop using it so that they didn't proliferate uh, viruses as much. And so a lot of the, um, the, the BIP participants that are queen breeders, um, this is one of the main goals that we have as part of the Be Informed Partnership, is that if we can get the virus levels and the queen quality measures of the different queens that are produced in these big breeding operations, so that one of their selective criteria is low virus levels, when they graft daughter queens off of those breeders, those are going to have low virus levels so that when you buy them, your queens and their resultant colonies are going to have lower virus levels, which very well may improve colony health um, when varroa and everything else gets in the mix, right? So that's kind of a um, trying to change the overall viral um, prevalence among the population is where this is all headed. Tim? So I don't know how many heard that, but, but the question was about whether or not, um, as part of this clinic, we're going to disclose the queen producers that are making use of this. Um, I've been asked um, to make the reports available, and that, I think, would violate their privacy. The, the, anybody that, gets, that uses this clinic, they um, get the information, they can do with it what they want. They can post it on their website and brag about it, or they can shove it in a drawer and ignore it. That's up to them. But hopefully, and we're not quite there yet, but hopefully once we have a critical mass of queen producers that are utilizing this, we can post their operations that are using the service, but not their grades, okay? But exactly right. Um, but I, I think we need a little bit more buy-in, and we're kind of building this as, as we're going along, but that I think would help provide a little bit of peer pressure for them to be utilizing this and to be verifying the quality of their stock over time. Um, so hopefully we will do this if we're able to make this keep going. No, exactly right. Um, and they've been incredibly, so the, the be informed uh, tech teams and the queen producers that we're working with on that, they've been incredibly forthcoming and very, very proactive in doing this. And they're incredibly excited about this because this is um, things that they've really been wanting for, for a long time, but we're still working out the kinks. Or 
So the question was whether these beekeepers followed up with us to see if it had any impact on their overall operation. They haven't sent us any queens back since. Um, I would love to see that. Um, that would be great to have kind of a, over time, a temporal component to that, uh, but they haven't sent us any queen. They haven't uh, contracted with us since then. Yeah. What's the cost of the analysis from your operation? So the cost, I don't know if we can see this, is about the cost of a queen to do the insemination. Um, it depends um, on the number. Oh gosh, this is all cut off. Um, but it's about $15 to $20 per queen to do the morphometrics and the sperm counts and sperm viability. And that's what most of the queen producers are doing. The, the viral analyses are substantially more expensive because that's using quantitative uh, PCR and other more expensive analyses. Um, so, you know, but they're all a la carte. They're um, laundry lists, so, you know, different, these different procedures, you can um, pick and choose which ones are important. We're working with um, an operation in Florida right now that wants to look at the effects of nosema and the effects of their fumi fumigillin treatment on nosema levels and the sperm viability of those queens, right? So it's really coming down to partnering with, with different beekeepers and queen producers of what they want to look at, little mini tests to see if this new mite treatment is, is killing off the sperm of their drones, or you know if this, um, if this grafting method is superior to this one. So it's really a way to empirically test um, different parts of their operation to improve their product. Now I should mention that uh, we're always trying to improve these different things. So we're using um, spa uh, facial recognition software where we're taking pictures of queens uh, and digitizing them so that they automatically get measured for their body size, which should improve the accuracy and the speed. So you know, again, it usually takes about two days to turn these reports around, uh, but this will make it even faster and uh, even better. Um, even though it makes undergrads go blind. Um, so yeah, so we're trying lots of different things with this. Another thing that we're doing as part of this is that we're trying to develop a, um, a, a genetic test rather than, which we do offer, we offer a genotyping analysis where we can um, measure the mating number of queens like what we have done in our previous studies. But instead of looking at mating number, we want to look at the overall genetic diversity of one's operation. So we sample X number of colonies from Y number of bee yards, and we do this kind of standard cookie cutter genetic analysis that includes assessing the number of sex alleles that they have in their operation. You remember that from this morning? So the more sex alleles that one has, the less inbreeding that that operation has. So it's a way that we may be able to um, ascertain the genetic health of a different queen producer operation versus another. Again, something that queen breeders are very excited about. So the question was, how many queens have we accumulated in our ever-growing database? Um, it's, it's about 500 plus queens now that we have analyzed. Um, and then as far as a neural network and computer learning uh, and other things, as far as the database, uh, it's outside my pay grade. Um, but you know, I think, and this is part of the philosophy of the Be Informed Partnership, is that these data are there in kind of like, this is the new age of big data, right? So as long as things are anonymized and can't be tracked to individual operations, um, that others can request data and be able to play around with them to be able to pull out trends that um, you know, may be there, but it's just gonna take you know, a kind of uh, different looks and different ways of, of looking at the data. So 
you know, we're always hoping to improve and find those types of trends. Um, but as far as kind of some of the more sophisticated computer things, that, that I'm a biologist, man. I'm not, I don't make that much. Um, so, you know, but I think there would be possibilities for that for sure. That's a great question. So the question was, is there anything that your individual beekeeper can do um, rather than doing it kind of in bulk or on a mass scale um, that can help improve queen quality? And so of all of these different measures that go in together, right, they're all correlated, right? So bigger queens mate more, store more sperm, everything else on average, right? Um, probably the best proxy for what makes a good queen good is the thorax width, okay? How wide she is. Now, that's because a queen's weight can really fluctuate, whether she's actively laying or not, right? Um, like, you know, how developed are her ovaries, whether she's taking a cleansing flight lately, to put it mildly, right? Um, there's lots of things that can go into weight. But thorax width, you gotta remember, when queens are born, they emerge from their cells, they don't vary in size um, at their thorax. Their abdomens may grow because their ovaries develop, but their thorax doesn't really change. So if you measure the width of the queen, that's usually the best measure. And if she is over 4.6 millimeters, that tends to be a, a, a pretty superior queen. Jim. So that's exactly the point, and I thank you for your attention. So, no. Um, the question was, how does this get us closer to solving the problem of these failing queens? And so, as I said before, we've investigated these things and we have this baseline now, but it hasn't highlighted a single factor that we need to pursue to fix. But what it does is it sets up our ability to say, well, this is what's normal, and then be able to compare to that, right? So, there are lots of studies that are going on now that are looking at different pesticides that are affecting uh, um, the sperm viability of queens, things like shipping um, practices. One thing that um, seems that very well may be a major problem, especially with queen packages, is that we all know that you can't let the bees overheat, right? When they're being shipped up, and they're in the cluster, if they overheat, they'll all die, and then you, know, you won't have any bees in your packages, right? But what we don't realize, and even though the cluster itself can, can stay warm uh, around the caged queen, if they get too cold, the queen will still be alive, but it can kill her sperm. So we need to be very careful about having our packages shipped when the conditions are too cool, all right? So those kind of things where it seems like, oh, that's not causing any problems, but it could be that we're not heating our packages enough or keeping them warm enough during transit, right? So there are things like that that may come into play, but now that we have this standard ruler, we're able to empirically measure them and kind of know very immediately the, the effect that it has. But it's very maddening that we've done a lot of studies trying to induce queen supersedure. We said before that, you know, supersedure can, um, three, three month old queens, they shouldn't be superseding that early. We know what's going on all the time. So we're setting up different conditions and trying to get colonies to supersede queens. And we try this and we try that and we can't get it to work. But, but it's happening all around us. So it's been very frustrating. Um, we're not there yet, but we're still trying. Mm -hmm. uh, just under practical beekeeping, if I have a, a frame of graphic queen cells, I'm just learning this correlation. I can have a very different 
emphasize sometimes the robustness of the wax being built out, and it may be positionally or even within the same level, would that correlate to you know, a bigger queen cell to a better queen? Is it worth to some of the ones that you know, are a little well formed but maybe a little smaller? Yeah, so the question was, how does kind of the morphology of the queen cell during development translate to the quality of the queen after she emerges? It's actually, there was a study out of Poland, I believe, that actually looked at that and showed that that's a pretty decent proxy as well. Um, that the size of the queen cell can translate into the size of the queen and therefore the resultant quality of the queen. And so culling of cells becomes very helpful and very important. Um, and so the size and quality of the cell builder, the colony that raises the queens, is really, really important for that. And so you can always graft way more queens than you ever need and then be selective of them, right? Uh, so we have an enveloped that into this um, kind of bioassay measuring kit, um, but there is very much some truth to that, that better looking cells are going to have superior queens. Yeah. Yeah, so the question was um, queens that workers raised by themselves under emergency conditions, right, versus commercially produced queens. And if you remember, let me see if I can back up. Queens, if you just go into a colony and you take the queen away, they will start raising queens right away, right? Now, unlike when you're grafting and you're grafting those, you know, smaller than you can see larvae into, into queen cups, the workers will actually raise queens from larvae that are one day old, two day old, or sometimes even three days old. Okay? Now, who do you think emerges first? The ones from the older larvae. Okay? So they raise a, a variety of them. Okay? Now they, as a colony, they want to get a queen right away, right? That's their motivation, is to get a queen as soon as possible. So the ones that emerge first, oftentimes, not always, will go and they'll kill all the other queen cells before they get a chance to fully develop. So who just took over the colony? A lower quality queen, okay? This is not always true. Okay, this is, I mean, sometimes they don't raise queens from older larvae. Um, sometimes those older larvae are of high quality, but on average, they tend to be of lower quality, about a third lower in quality, and therefore they're not as good. Now that is different from swarm cells, queens raised from swarm cells. Right? Why is that? Why are emergency queens different from swarm cell queens? Because they're building it, so they're actually making the queen in order to swarm, and it's not an active Exactly. So emergency queens are raised from worker brood, where they they transform the the comb from worker cells. Swarm cells, the queen laid an egg in the cell, so they're fed royal jelly from day zero. Right? So there's some substantial differences there, but if you're just letting colonies requeen, that's perfectly fine. But just realize that there are opposing selective pressures on colonies. One is to have as good a queen as possible, the other is having a queen as soon as possible. Those things are actually in opposition to each other. Okay? And in many cases, it's getting a queen as soon as possible wins out over getting the best queen possible. All right? So you need to be careful in requeening through emergency queen rearing versus grafting or through swarm cells. There was another question somewhere? Yeah.
If you take a queen cell from one colony and put it in another, yeah, absolutely, that's a great way to requeen um, if that other unit is queenless. Now again, she needs to emerge, mate, and start laying eggs. So there's a delay, a time lag in that, but um, it is certainly, in fact, I don't think it's nearly done as much as it probably should. It's a, it's a pretty effective way to, to requeen, is by using cells rather than, than uh, caged queens. Other questions? Oh, sorry. Yeah, the, I'm, I'm often asked if I can expand on, on that uh, observation. I'm often asked, um, how many drone source colonies do you need to mate queens, right? Um, and where do you place them? And my answer is enough and in the perfect spots. Right? Um, enough is, again, kind of, uh, subjective, but in general, I think uh, Larry Connor had a, had a nice book that came out a couple years ago about, about um, mating and queen rearing, um, and he had a formula in there, I forget what it was, but it's something like for every 10 queens that you have to mate, you want a full comb of drone brood or something like that. Um, I'm, I'm forgetting what it is offhand, but there's, uh, there's some ways that you can, if a queen needs to mate with 12, or preferably 20, right, and then you count up how many drones are on a frame, you know, and divide by ages and other things, you can kind of come up with a, um, a good metric for that. But in essence, the more the better, right? That the more of a drone population that's out there, the more diverse that drone population is, the better it's going to be. Well, again, the, the diversity of drones coming from the same colony is going to be limited, right? So if a queen mates with 100 drones, but they're all brothers, they're going to be genetically diverse in one sense, but lacking genetic diversity in others. And I forgot to add those slides for you, Tim, about the studies that we've done, um, kind of the meta-analysis. But, you know, using all of the, um, uh, the patriline data from all of these studies, because we've looked at the mating numbers of these queens, we looked at the proportion of commercially produced queens that are sisters to each other. When you buy two queens from the same operator, what's the likelihood that they're gonna be sisters? A lot higher than what you'd find out um, kind of, we used a, uh, the Africanized bees as kind of the natural source um, comparison, right? So a lot more sister queens that you buy from commercially produced queens, which is probably um, understandable. But what percentage do you think are mating with their own brothers? Again, higher than in Africanized populations. It's about, it's not as bad as you think, it's about maybe 10, 15%, okay? But makes that diversity and multiple mating all the more important, right? But to get back to your original question about where you place the drone source colonies, again, you don't wanna put your mating nukes of the queens that you want to mate right next to the drones that you want them to mate with. Because naturally, the queens are going to fly further than the drones to avoid inbreeding. Because usually, drones from their own colony is, you know, their brothers, and even being from North Carolina, that's illegal, right? <laughs> so what you want to do, if you want these queens to mate with these drones, is you have the queens in the middle of an area in your mating yard, and then at about one mile away, you want to per put a perfect spherical ring in the environment 
of as many drone colonies as you possibly can. Easy. No problem. Now obviously, you know, what's ideal is, is not feasible. You just do the best that you can do. Um, and you do, again, I think the proof is in the pudding. And most of the time, when queens and drones are allowed to go and do their thing, they do it pretty successfully.